would say when a seva opportunity knocks on your door, never turn away from it. Serving mankind is serving God. I mean, I always say until my last breath, I want to serve anyway. I have grown and uh, there's been so much of positive changes. Like I've learned humility. I've learned so many things. I know there's some people who tell me, oh, you're the chosen one. That's why you're able to be. I'm going like, no, it's because for my spiritual growth, I need this. So maybe I'm benefiting even more than whoever that I'm serving. Leila Sham is the founder and executive director of the Other Side Foundation that serves marginalized children and adults in rural Zambia. Her spiritual mentor, Sri Sancha Sai Baba, guided her to a more fulfilling life by helping others to become more fulfilled. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded in Southern France and San Diego, California on June 16th, 2022. Leela Sigaram Chong, thank you very much for joining us on Soul Journeys today. Saram Ted. Leela's spiritual teacher is Sai Baba, whom she says hears her every call for help. Does he always respond to them in a favorable way? I would say 90% yes, and I would be sincerely speaking to him. And um, it manifests. Whatever I ask for does manifest. I'm just full of gratitude that it has. And never did I realize until much later that he's actually responding and listening, most of all, to everything that I'm saying. So what was it that attracted her to this holy man? What brought me to Baba was his teachings more than anything else, where I realized that the pathway to God is not only through rituals or devotion, but it could be also karma yoga, which is service to mankind. And Baba has always said, Parimana Vaseva is Mother Vaseva, which is uh, service to mankind is service to God. And among the greatest benefits of doing Seva, smiles. And that's where I got the taste of Seva. When I saw the smiles, just, just the smiles did everything for me. I mean, it made my day. And for me, happiness was when I saw somebody else being happy. And I sincerely prayed after that. And I've always prayed to be able to serve since I knew Baba, of course. I guess it all culminated in what I'm doing right now at the moment, which is really a project which is started from a, you know, I mean, from, from nothing and we are where we are today. I'd like to pick up on that and say a little bit more about that from my own perspective, reading up on you. First of all, I want to repeat the line you said, which is just wonderful in my estimation, that what makes you happy is when you help another person to become happy and you see that happiness on their face. I can't think of a better way of describing what the essence of happiness is and where it comes from in a person than that. And you've been at this for a long time. In fact, you have a wonderful organization that I've had a chance to look at online and I invite others to do it too. This is in Zambia. How did you get involved at such a deep level in such a worthy cause? When we stopped working and we're kind of young retirees, um, we, I've, as I said, um, I've always wanted to save, do seva, and I was doing ad hoc seva wherever I was, in whichever country I was in. And it was at this time in Africa, in Zambia, while working on a service project, that a woman approached Leela's husband with a special request. She asked my husband, and she said, uh, can you do something for these children? Can you set up an orphanage or something? And my husband went, no, 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 this is really not my field. I'll get my wife to come. <laughs> and when I came and I said, look, an orphanage is just going to give the children shelter and food to eat. But education is going to take them, it's going to open doors for them. So I, I do have pedagogic experience. Let me see what I can do. I went back home and I had nothing. I just had pieces of paper and some, you know, uh, chalks, uh, sorry, some uh, crayons. And I went back the next day with that. And I think if you go into my website, you'd see a, a photo of me sitting on the floor with 15 children, a bare floor in winter with uh, sheets of paper and crayons. And that's how it started with 15 children. And it went up to 600. Uh, orphans and vulnerable children 
which we uh, where we actually later built a school but today we only have 450 children because I've reduced the numbers so that we can give uh, quality food and education and whatever services we're offering it's that is where we are today. How many problems do you have to overcome in your work with the children of Zambia and is there a time when everything's running smoothly with no problems? Are you kidding? No. <laughs> From day one, it has been problems because we didn't go to Zambia to set up our own foundation. We went to Zambia for another NGO. In the process, this came up. When I started this and I saw it growing, because from 15 students, we ended up having about 60 within six months because I had also started a um, adult education for the single mothers at the same time. So it was children on one side, uh, ladies on the other side, in an open kind of shed. It was just one huge hall. You had children screaming on one side and adults on the other side. And we decided not to continue with the NGO that we went for. So where was I going to find funding to pay salaries and keep that school under the, it was, a, it was a church shed that I was using. And when I went back to Singapore, and you wouldn't believe it, the first two donations I got was from two old ladies, my mother's friends, who gave me $50 each. <laughs> of course, I thanked them profusely, but I was thinking to myself, you know, where is this going to take me? Because, you know, with $100, you know, you can't get very far. But something happened. I took the, the, that money and I put it on, in the altar. If I'm not mistaken, yes, I put it under Mother Teresa's photo. And next to it is Baba's chair with Baba's photo. I was saying my prayers, I finished my prayers. And by the time I opened my eyes, that $50 had flown, I presumed had flown, and it was in Baba's chair under Baba's photo. And I told this to a girlfriend of mine, and she said, look, this, this is definitely a blessing from Baba. You don't have to look for your funding. Just carry on with what you want to do. And it, this event was then followed by a dream in which Sai Baba said, I bless your project. And then later, after receiving her first two small donations of $50 each, a third donor showed up with a shocking announcement. He became a billionaire through all his uh, businesses in Africa. He said, Leela, don't look for funding anywhere. I will fund the whole project because Africa has given me so much. I can't do what you are doing, but let me fund it. And this is the big one. His birthday is on 23rd November. <laughs> He's an atheist, by the way. Does he have curly black hair like that oh, gentleman? Yeah. He's, He's curly white hair. He's an atheist. And he's always teasing me about Baba. And he goes like, how's your guru? And you can call it a coincidence. You can call it whatever you want, right? Is he still alive? Does he still support you? He's alive, but he doesn't support us because anymore. Um, his name is Daniel Sigo. And we are very, very grateful for it, to him because we couldn't have come this far without him. We had an agreement that he will fund the project for 10 years. And when he retires, you know, we've got to become self-sustaining. Yeah. Right. But a school which is completely free, you know, we, we offer all the services free, whether it's education, medical, or food, and we don't generate any income, how is it going to be self-sustaining, right? So, well, he, um, at the end of two, 2020, he said yes, um, he stopped funding us. And, um, yeah, right now, it's, it's not easy getting funding and uh, we are managing again with Baba's grace because every time I'm sitting and thinking, how am I going to do this? And how is the, because the bulk of our expenses is the food and the teacher's salary. Did you say this also includes housing or is it primarily a school, which is hugely valuable all by itself? It's, it's just primarily a school that we built, a primary school for orphans and vulnerable children. Vulnerable in the sense that any family that was earning less than, say, 30 US a month, we consider them as vulnerable. 
and uh, the orphans are mainly looked after by their grandmothers. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this subject that you brought up. Tell me the origin of the name of your foundation, yeah. and where did that name come from, the other side? It was me. I was sitting on the floor with the 15 children, a drawing, and when I looked up, it was an old church shack, and there were three pairs of eyes. In fact, you will see it on our logo, too three pairs of eyes looking from the other side at what I was doing. And I was looking at these children and I was thinking, you think that my side is so great. I've got so much to learn from you. So from each side in life, it depends from which side you're looking at. You know, it's it's the other side. And that's how um, the name came about. You know, I decided, I said, look, I want to call it the other side because I'm on this side, they are on that side. And I think the grass is greener there. They think the grass is greener here. There's always another side to life anyway. Well, I'm a little interested in knowing how you and your husband, who I met very briefly there, um, became inspired after you presumably retired from your careers and you had traveled extensively to many countries. I don't know what your work was, but it would take a lot of managerial skill. I'm guessing that was involved somehow for you to be able to do this and sustain it after you both retired. Yes, um, how this came about, as I said, it's, um, I always wanted to do Seva and I've already started. And when this came about, he said, I mean, I knew I couldn't do this alone. Denny has got all the managerial skills of, um, you know, the accounting side. And my skills come in from the, my background is, training in sales and marketing. And prior to that, I was teaching. And by the way, all the donations that comes into TOSF, 100% of the donations goes to the project, to the children and to the people that benefit from the project. And among the most important lessons Leela is learning from all of this work? I would say when a saver opportunity knocks on your door, never turn away from it because Serving mankind is serving God. And if you're on a spiritual path, there are different avenues to get to the source. So this is another way to go back to your source. I mean, I always say until my last breath, I want to serve anyway, you know, so. And you are, and you will. I have no doubt about it whatsoever. And as you serve, you grow. And I have no doubt about that either. So it's a good recipe for how we lead our lives, whether yeah, I mean, we're in a career or not. Yeah, because it's it's through this service that I have, as you said, grow. That's the exact word. I have grown and uh, there's been so much of positive changes. Like I've learned humility. I've learned so many things. So it's, it's, it's yeah. people always say, they think that by doing Seva, you are giving, but you're receiving just as much growing as, as you say, you know, spiritually. Yeah. You, yeah, because um, I know there's some people who tell me, oh, you're the chosen one. That's why you're able to be. I'm going like, no, it's because for my spiritual growth, I need this. So maybe I'm benefiting even more than whoever that I'm serving. Yeah. Right. So it's we are the great. ones that have to be thankful. If anybody needs a motivation to do more seva, that would be one of the reasons. And the other is that it truly does to remember what you said about seeing a smile on the face of a person you're serving brings a smile to your own face. Absolutely. That's another huge reason and motivation. You know, I mean, and, and this is, take it, you, you take it the way you want. But the first time my husband asked me when I first started going out in Nigeria to do Seva with the Nigerians, <clears throat> and my husband is going like, why are you going out in the sun and, and getting tired? And, you know, look at me. I just played golf. I have, you know, life is great. And he goes, and I says, well, you don't know the satisfaction. He says, I am satisfied. I've, I've got you. I've got a great life. You know, you don't have to do this. And I said exactly the same thing. I said, when you see, when I see a smile on somebody's face, that gives me all the satisfaction in the world. Yeah. And that's what that keeps me going. And it's the same thing when I was in the land office asking the commissioner of lands to put his last signature so that I can get my papers. And he asked me the same question. What is, what is, what is there in this for you? 
And I said to him, because I put a smile on somebody's face. He looked at me all puzzled. He signed and he says, here, take it, you know. <laughs> so, but, and the Zambian lady who, uh, who accompanied me, she said, do you know he didn't understand what you said? Because when do you see somebody do something for nothing in return? Because there's always some kind of ulterior motive. I said, I don't know about the ulterior motive. Mine is just, I'm just so elated when, you know, it's so joyful to see somebody's life changing, somebody having food to eat. Um, you know, uh, there was one old lady who had a stroke, uh, one of the children's grandmother. She was supporting five grandchildren and she had a stroke and I went to see her and uh, I realized that it was because of the cold and she wasn't keeping herself warm that she had this partial stroke and all I gave her was socks and made sure she had warm clothing and she recovered from a stroke and you know she came for the parents meeting and she was dancing around and hugging me and said look you know I'm all well and you know it's uh, it's the socks that you gave and the warm clothing and I'm going like no it's God's blessings but simple things like that and you know when a child has um, AIDS they have uh, diarrhea. They have a lot of, uh, you know, stomach issues. And just simple nutrition, the right nutrition and the right medication in time will save their lives and prolong their lives. You know, one thing I realized very early, Ted, was that when I started doing Seva in Nigeria, and then we were also posted in Vietnam when I used to do it in Vietnam or wherever I went in India, I, I realized that you can only reach this deep into your pockets. I mean, you know, we are not billionaires, but I, re I realized very early when I started Saver that your knowledge and your time is, is, is pitless. I mean, you can give as much as you want, right? And that's when I decided when, if I ever stop working, this is how I want to give back. I want to give my time and whatever knowledge I have that I've acquired all these years, into service. And that's exactly what it is. You know, uh, you don't have to have lots of money or, I mean, look at what you're doing. You know, it's just your time and your expertise that is doing, you know, and soldiers. I mean, the first time I heard about soldiers was in, I think when you've just started, was it 2000, 2002, 2003? Well, we actually started it in 1997 when Jody and I first met. And uh, we went to San Francisco and interviewed a man. Who, who knew of Sai Baba, uh, he wrote the world famous book back in the 60s and 70s in the religions of man. But we didn't know anything about the internet. And so we would send them around on big bulky cassettes to people and friends of ours in India uh, and, and in America, but it was very cost prohibitive. And then as DVDs came along and then finally mm -hmm. in 2008, when YouTube made it available for myself to use this, I just jumped on it. So that's our background. You've been doing this for ever so long and um, the, the, the amount of viewers you have and, you know, it is, and sometimes I've read comments where people are saying, this is exactly the message I needed or, you know, it coincides with what I was feeling. And uh, I remember seeing the old video, I mean, the old soldiers on Father Charles. Yeah, He's, he was great. Uh, and and I, I think those will live forever if, if YouTube continues. Both Father Charles and Leela and Denny had charity work projects in Nigeria at one time, giving them common interests with Seva and Sai Baba. Father Charles was such an inspiration in our life. I'll never forget the time when I first met him. I met Father Charles for the first time at Sai Baba's ashram on the pathway just outside of the Western Canteen. As a priest, I told him, he had to celebrate Catholic Mass inside the ashram on Christmas morning. But first, we had to get permission from Sai Baba himself. And we did. It has to come from him. So he got the permission for Father Charles from Sai Baba to say Mass on Christmas Day. And there were people from all walks of life and beliefs. I was there. You were there? <laughs> this day I had my first communion. Because I went for that Christmas mass that year, we sang in the choir. Oh my goodness! 2007 or 2008. That's exactly right. Right. Yeah. Uh, that photo of uh, all of us singing in the choir. And when I went for the mass, 
I, I went up to him when he was giving communion and I said, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a Christian, can I have communion? And he said, of course you can. You, you are a Christian in heart or he said something, he said, of course you can. And later he explained to me, he says, you do not have to be a Christian to have communion. And uh, because I once, uh, when my mother-in-law passed away and at the church, when at the end of the service uh, for a funeral, they were, they were doing communion. And the priest asked me, he says, are you a Christian? And I said, no. And he says, I can't give you communion. So that's why I asked Father Charles. And when Father Charles said this, from then on, every time I'm, I'm walking into a church, even in Rome, when I went to the Vatican, it's always communion time. And I keep going for communions. It would happen in the Assisi church. Uh, with the Vatican, I can I can name you a whole list of churches. So now I go for communion, though I'm not Christian. What a great story! Thank you for telling me that. Yeah, because uh, um, my husband is a Catholic, and um, he says, "No, you can't go for a communion unless you fast." He says, "That's how I used to do it with my grandfather. <laughs> you could fast, but Father Charles says, "No, you don't have to fast. You know, you don't have to be a Christian. It's meant for." <laughs> Tell your husband that that's something I did as a kid back in the 1950s, and I learned quickly that you didn't have to fast anymore, so I could always have a hearty breakfast before going to church on Sunday mornings. <laughs> well, uh, this is just great. I wanted to remind you also that we hadn't talked to Father Charles for many, many years for a whole series of reasons. We just all had busy lives. And finally, I sent him an invitation for a Zoom chat it would have been late in the evening where he lived in Nigeria. And he answered right away. We had a wonderful chat. He was doing well. He was very happy. He was very healthy. You have not changed at all, Father. Father, you look exactly the same. Really? I don't think so. A lot of great. <laughs> <laughs> always happy, always holy, Father Charles. And then Father Charles contracted malaria, and two weeks later, he was gone. Uh, and I was so happy to have had that opportunity for Jody and I to be with him one last time and to record it, especially for our memories. So I'm so happy you've met him. I'm so happy we met because of, uh, in a roundabout way, because of him. Leela now ends her time with us by repeating what she said at the beginning of this interview. Baba hears you, and he answers you. So be watchful. Oh, by the way, this pendant was also blessed by him. Oh, that's great. This is what I meant when I told you that you can be in any part of the world and ask him something. This, I was not Puttaparthi in the room. And I said, I always do this line on him. If you are God, then I want these three pendants blessed. And it happened. And I was sitting in France. It was snowing in year 2001. And all my friends were going to Puttaparthi. And I was sitting there and I'm saying, look, Bob, I'm sitting here in this cold winter and all my friends are going. And if you are God, I want a photo blessed by you. In January, my girlfriend uh, from India says, by the way, your photo got blessed. Swami came and blessed, so you have a photo, a blessed photo from Swami. And I'm going, yay, you know, he heard me, he heard me. And then a month later, the girlfriend from New Zealand also calls me and says, uh, Leela, I'm in Singapore and let me drop off the, the photo that Baba blessed. Because I'd asked three people, so I had two photos. I'm going, wow, this is a bonus. I've got two photos. And I was wondering, why would Baba, okay, and then I realized because I have two homes and I have two altars. This is what I meant by I wanted to speak about, uh, you know, he listens and he responds. You know, the, the pendant was the same. My niece had asked me, she said, what do you want? I'm in Puttaparthi. And she says, get me, a, she says, get me a Baba pendant. I'm going like, yeah, I could walk into a store and get it. But let me see. So I went to buy three gold pendants and I gave it to, I'm sure you know Venkatesh, right? Yep. The one who was revived. Sure. From I gave it to him because these are the, you know, the, the, the selected ones are very close to Baba. Right? Got it blessed. I gave it to him and I said, uncle, can you get it blessed? He said, let's see if you're lucky. That's what he said. Next day, I'm, I'm coming out of Darshan. He says, come, come, your pendants are blessed. I'm going like, 
Parks or he did hear a name, and, and it was not him. He said that there was another guy from Canada who was in the, in the hall and he gave it to him because it was his birthday. And he said, I thought you'd have a better chance. And that guy told Venkatesh that when Baba came out of the car, he walked straight to the Canadian guy and he blessed three pendants before ask, you know, well, blessing him on his birthday. So this is what I mean. I mean, you know, in so many instances, he, Baba has been, he, he is listening all the time. And Leela's major request from Sai Baba, her yearning to do seva. I would say when a seva opportunity knocks on your door, never turn away from it because serving mankind is serving God. I have to add that we have broadened our scope of service. We started with children. When we, were, when we are on the ground, we see that the grandmothers need help and so do the single mothers. So the funding also goes towards uh, evening adult education for the single mothers. We give uh, groceries, especially during the COVID and even out of the COVID, we give them food hampers. So the funding goes into all that, all the operations. For Leela and Denny, their work is selfless love in action, but their satisfaction in return is incomparable. When I see a smile on somebody's face, that gives me all the satisfaction in the world. Just, just the smiles did everything for me. I mean, it made my day. And I guess people are happy in different ways. And for me, happiness was when I saw somebody else being happy. I'm just so elated when, you know, it's so joyful to see somebody's life changing, somebody having food to eat. One thing I realized very early, Ted, was that when I started doing Seva, your knowledge and your time is, is it's pitless. I mean, you can give as much as you want, right? And that's when I decided when, if I ever stop working, this is how I want to give back. I want to give my time and whatever knowledge I have that I've acquired all these years into service. It's amazing. Anyway. Lila, thank you again. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Oh. And uh, good luck with your projects. Good luck with your, your travels and whatever is next on the agenda for Dennis and you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye and Sairam. Sairam, Sairam.